Germany and America. Germany calling. We're operating again over six stations. Two in the 25 and the others in the 28, 31, 41 and 49 meter band. We now present Lord Rohrhoff speaking to England. To say the British Empire is in danger today would be a very feeble understatement. Never before has it been in such a perilous position. Until Roosevelt and Churchill so needlessly provoked Japan into taking up arms, the greater part of the British Empire felt itself outside the war zone. Of course, to be outside the war zone is not necessarily to be safe. For example, Canada was secure against any attack by Germany or Italy. But she was not secure against peaceful penetration by the United States. The agreement just concluded, whereby the virtual control of her industries falls into American hands, and whereby tariffs, customs, and other functions of independence may be arbitrarily removed by a committee under American domination, this charter of Canadian subjugation was not a mushroom growth. It was rather the culmination at a suitable moment of the plans which Roosevelt and his predecessors have been making for years to exclude British influence from both American continents. And, as a member of the Rockefeller family recently said in public, to give the United States a monopoly in the Western Hemisphere. Mr. Casimir, the Australian Prime Minister, has addressed directly to President Roosevelt what amounts to an appeal for aid without safeguards. How far this message was inspired by Churchill himself, I cannot say. But Roosevelt now has an excuse for landing troops in Australia and keeping them there if he can until that inconceivable day when all Britain's debt to the United States shall have been paid. A member of the New Zealand cabinet declares that the most perilous moment in the history of his country has arrived. Well, the peoples of Australia and New Zealand may be thinking is easy to imagine. Now, troops are fighting in North Africa to gain for Churchill prestige and propaganda victories, which, as previous events have shown, can exert no influence upon the issue of the war as a whole. They are a war with Japan, who has shown a most remarkable talent for carrying out multiple attacks on the widest scale. And on the other hand, they know that if American troops appeared in the guise of saviors, they will remain in the role of bailiffs. They cannot be reassured by statements from the BBC to their face that the home government sympathizes with their position, understands their concern, and will not forget them. But that on the other hand, they cannot expect the British forces to be everywhere at the same time. While such useless phrases might be accepted by the patient, docile, and uncritical British public, they are not sufficient to assuage the colonial unrest. Now, it is all the more remarkable that the United States should be gaining such an ascendancy over the British Empire when Roosevelt's conduct of the war against Japan has been such a signal failure up to the present. Having lost his Pacific fleet, he can hardly afford to pose as the master of the situation. And yet, Mr. Churchill will, in my opinion, bow to his wishes even more obsequiously than in the past. Without wishing in the smallest degree to underestimate the function of air power in the East Asian and Pacific War, a function 
which the Japanese have demonstrated with splendid success. I cannot help attributing Britain's present horrible dilemma to her naval weakness, at least in large part. A theater of war, including the Pacific Ocean, must needs raise great naval problems. If any British Prime Minister today were able to compensate for American naval losses by sending a large fleet to the Pacific, he could, if he had the will, tell Roosevelt to keep his hands off the Empire. The Royal Navy has no ships to spare, and the fate of the Prince of Wales and the Repulse is a token but a few warships would not be enough. Many are needed. The absolute size of a navy is of secondary importance in comparison with the range of tasks which it has to perform. For example, Switzerland does not need any battle cruisers. No navy can be, or at any rate can within years be large enough to do battle against powerful opponents in all the waters of the world at the same time. The rulers of states interested in naval warfare must therefore either restrict their commitments or take the consequences. Germany, for example, did not require a large navy. Britain did. And in this respect, the British preparations for war were very inadequate. For many decades, Britain maintained her position in Eastern Asia on the strength of prestige and her navy, the two factors being very closely related. Leaving aside all questions of morality, let us say that if successive British government, their chance of success was dependent in large measure on naval supremacy. Had Britain abstained from European entanglement, had our rulers renounced the claim to meddle in European affairs, then the power of the British power in Eastern Asia might well have endured longer. It might have been possible to indulge the luxury of interfering with the peoples of Asia by refraining from the attempt to dominate Europe as well. Although in the East, the prestige of Britain has been declining for many years now. But the task of dominating both Europe and Asia is infinitely too great for Britain and the United States combined. When the demands on the Royal Navy were such that every single warship had to do the work of at least half a dozen. Surely, it would have been a prudent policy to leave Japan alone, and at least to abstain from provocation of the type that Roosevelt and Churchill seemed to think so valorous. In November alone, the German forces sank the following British naval units. One aircraft carrier, one cruiser, three destroyers, and a number of smaller vessels. They damaged two battleships, including the Prince of Wales, the Repulse, and the seaplane carrier Unicorn of 14,500 tons. There's only a part of the price paid for the attempt to wage naval warfare on the Churchillian scale. Losses at this rate render far more difficult the task of the British commanders in solving every problem the war presents. Naval power for Britain is not an independent function. It is an indispensable aspect of our war potential as a whole. The United States are compact. The defense of their territory in the North American continent is no difficult matter. But the British Empire is scattered all over the world and is incomparably more assailable than the USA. What Roosevelt may lose in the Pacific is small in comparison with what Britain stands to lose. 
Even India is threatened. Canada is practically an American dominion, ruled by Roosevelt. The fate of Australia and New Zealand hangs in the balance. The Royal Air Force is too weak. The Royal Navy is too weak. And as yet, the common sense of the British people is too weak to perceive the catastrophic nature of the plight into which they have allowed Churchill to lead them. Germany calling, and all of America. You have just been listening to Law Hall. And this talk by Law Hall will be repeated at 10.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tonight. We should like now to repeat an announcement for 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock, in 18 minutes from now, you will be listening to an interview with Jane Anderson and two Latvian women who journeyed during the Christmas season to Berlin to request Jane Anderson to deliver a message to the American people concerning the ravages of the Red Terror during the occupation of Latvia by communist forces. At 9 o'clock, Jane Anderson interview. The New York Times reports the British cruiser Exeter has been run aground near Port Stanley on the east coast of the Falkland Islands. This American newspaper states that the Exeter has been so severely damaged by the artillery of the Admiral Graf Spee that it is impossible to make the ship seaworthy again. As some of the guns of the Exeter are still in good working order, the British Admiralty obviously intends to make use of the Hulk as an additional coastal battery at Port Stanley. This morning, strong German forces have entered or have been landed in these two countries. To cover these military operations, extensive mine barrages have been laid. While British and French military experts are still writing articles, wondering why Germany has not yet started a blitzkrieg on the Western Front, lightning-like actions of the German defense forces have informed Mr. Churchill and Monsieur Paul Reynaud that Germany is not prepared to allow Great Britain and France to infest the North Sea, the Arctic Sea, and Northern Europe with further strategic positions like Gibraltar, Malta, and Corsica. New Germany is determined to deal any power a decisive blow if that power stretches out its hands with the intention of throttling the German people. Germany has no quarrels with Denmark and Norway that Germany has carefully studied the maritime history of Great Britain. She remembers Copenhagen in 1807. She remembers the seizing of Malta and Gibraltar. She remembers the bombardment of Alexandria in 1882, and she has not forgotten that England and France were making preparations to occupy the Balearic Islands during the Spanish Civil War. That attempt was frustrated by Italian watchfulness. Germany has for months been just as observant and alive to the danger which threatens all strategical points in Northern Europe that might serve as naval or air force bases for Great Britain and France in their war of destruction against Germany. Mr. Winston Churchill knows today that he has no longer any chance of repeating his exploits of Sydney Street in Antwerp, Gallipoli and Mormans that versatile and agile amateur strategist is at last up against a leadership and a defense force of a people keyed up to a maximum of activity and having achieved the acme of technical perfection. They do not have to discuss the Blitzkrieg as a theoretical problem because they are the human embodiment of that cleansing atmospheric phenomenon, the thunderstorm, which dispels the sultry atmosphere of intrigues and conspiracies, of political crime and of indifference to human suffering. German motorized troops and tanks, which crossed the German-Danish frontier near Flensburg and Tondern at 5.15 a.m. this morning, are now on their way north via Apenrade and Esbjerg. 
Today at dawn, German troops landed near Middelfarth on the Little Belt and occupied the bridge over the Little Belt. German naval forces have entered the Great Belt and landed troops at Corsair and Newbork. German troops and a German armoured train have crossed the Baltic by ferry from Warnemünde to Genza, whence they are advancing northwards. The Fording Bork Bridge, connecting the islands of Zeeland and Falster, was occupied at the same time. At dawn, German troops landed in Copenhagen. The citadel and the wireless station were occupied. Since 8 a.m., the whole town has been in German hands. The Supreme Command and the German Defence Forces further announced it. The advance of the German troops northwards in Jutland and on the Danish islands is making rapid progress. The Danish government has instructed the Danish troops to offer no resistance. The German and Danish military commanders established contact during the morning. The occupation of the most important strategic points in the whole of Norway by German troops is progressing quickly. Units of all three branches of the German defense forces are successfully cooperating. At most points, the slight local resistance of Norwegian troops has ceased. On the air bases in Jutland and southern Norway, German Air Force units have landed. The Supreme Command of the German Defense Forces further announces. During the evening of April the 8th, German Heinkel bombers again attacked British naval forces lying at anchor in Scarpa Flow with considerable success. Two capital ships, amongst them a battleship, were severely damaged by bombs. Three further heavy units were considerably damaged by explosions, which occurred in the immediate vicinity of these ships. During April the 8th, extensive reconnaissance flights over the North Sea, as far as the 65th degree north, and over north and eastern France, were carried out by the German Air Force. Two British warplanes, a fighter, and a Sunderland seaplane were shot down. Two German planes are missing. This morning, the German minister in Copenhagen handed to the Danish government a German note explaining the attitude of the German government in regard to the plans of the Allies to extend the war to Scandinavia and informing it that Germany will ensure the protection of Danish neutrality and of the security of Denmark. As a result of conversations between the German minister and the Danish prime minister and cabinet, the Danish government decided, in consideration of the circumstances, to accept German protection with a diplomatic proviso and to agree to the conditions outlined in the German note. It is reported from Copenhagen that the whole city is perfectly quiet. The Danish authorities have promised their most loyal cooperation. The Danish radio is broadcasting its scheduled program and the Copenhagen newspapers are being published as usual. No incidents have occurred in Copenhagen or during the occupation of Jutland. The Swedish press features the events in Denmark and Norway. The wise attitude of the Danish government has made a deep impression on the Swedish population. Swedish public opinion is convinced that the events in Norway will not lead to a more extensive conflict. In well-informed political circles in Sweden, the opinion prevails that Swedish neutrality is not menaced by Germany, so long as England does not attempt to violate it. There are the Reichstein to Hamburg, Station Bremen 1, Station Bremen 2, and Station DJB. This is the end of our news in English. Our next transmission of news in English will take place at 7.15 p.m. British Summer Time and will be broadcast from Hamburg, Bremen, and DJA on the 31-meter band. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. The Supreme Command of the German Defense Forces announces the operations to occupy Denmark and the Norwegian coast have proceeded according to plan today. 
On marching into and landing on Danish territory, no incidents occurred anywhere. No significant resistance was offered along the coast of Norway, except near Oslo. Resistance there was broken during the afternoon, and Oslo itself was occupied. The German minister to Norway, Dr. Breyer, received representatives of the Norwegian press today and informed them of a new appeal which he has addressed to the Norwegian government. It runs as follows. In recalling this morning's appeal, I wish once more to draw the attention of the Norwegian government to the fact that any resistance to Germany's action would be completely senseless and would only lead to an aggravation of Norway's position. I repeat that by her measures, Germany does not intend to infringe the territorial integrity or political independence of the Kingdom of Norway, either now or in the future. Germany calling. Germany calling. Germany calling. I want to discuss with you some topics of current interest. Four days ago, under the orders of their supreme commander, the German forces established one of the greatest feats and triumphs in the annals of military history. In relation to the magnitude of its achievements, the campaign was the shortest of which any record is available. Three weeks ago, Mr. Chamberlain predicted the possibility of warfare in Scandinavia. Nobody in Britain paid any great attention to his prophecy, as it lacked the note of novelty. For months, Mr. Winston Churchill had been lecturing the neutrals on their duties and using veiled threats to coerce them into hostilities on Britain's side. Mr. Horrible a man well qualified to voice the sentiment of international finance, had openly demanded that the Allies should intervene by force of arms in the Russo-Finnish war, regardless of the violation of Scandinavian neutrality, which such intervention must imply. On the day when Finland suddenly saw wisdom and made peace, the British Prime Minister, knowing that the Russo Finnish War was over, offered to fight side by side with the Finns to the bitter end. And Monsieur Galarier revealed the fact that 50,000 troops had been standing by for a fortnight, ready to invade Scandinavia. As Milton says, they also serve who only stand and wait. However, the depression which settled over London when the Russians and the Finns came to terms began to lift. Gradually but surely. There emerged a feeling that if only Mr. Churchill were given full power to do as he pleased, some brilliant result could be achieved somewhere. Accordingly, he was promoted to what in effect is the supreme command of the British forces. Although he clung to nation to the Admiralty, where he had taken the trouble to install his 25 year old furniture, a pair of carpet slippers, and three telephones. Black, red, and green, for ordinary, extraordinary, and secret purposes, respectively. Most fortified, the aged warlord, a far famed Gallipoli renowned, was set up by Neville Chamberlain as the man who was a match for Hitler. Lord Crewe paved the way for the climax by stating on behalf of the British government that Britain did not propose to be bound by technical consideration of international law. The violation of Norwegian territorial waters by the brutal and murderous attack on the Altna was the only victory that Britain had so far won. But it was encouraging. It had been possible to shoot unarmed seamen on the ice in neutral territory without incurring any terrible vengeance. And that the more British strategists pondered upon the success of this glorious operation, the more certainly they began to feel 
that a warfare conducted upon these lines was bound to succeed. The next stage was marked by a loud trumpeting and bray from the British Prime Minister and his chief of staff, General Ironside. They assembled to think of what might have happened and jammed along an armed offensive last September. But all was well now. This poor fellow had missed the bus. The corner had been turned. Mr. Churchill's forces were prepared for all eventualities. And Mr. Chamberlain felt ten times as confident as he had felt seven months previously. This barrage of joyous optimism having been thrown up, the British government announced its intention of converting Norway's territorial waters into a naval zone by laying mines within them. Norway protested, and her protest was rejected. When she had protested against the outmark outrage, she was met with a counter protest. This time, she was met with the advance of the British Navy and Air Force against her. While, however, this advance was beginning, something dramatic happened. The man who had missed the bus acted like lightning. This Mercedes bent proved rather better than the trundling rolling stock of the London General Omnibus Company. The Supreme Warlord of Whitehall discovered on Tuesday morning, doubtless with the help of his colored telephone, that Denmark and Norway had been occupied by German forces. Their economic resources had fallen into German hands. England had lost not only the most valuable sources of bacon, butter, timber, nickel, and iron. She had lost all hope of making Scandinavia a strategic base of operations against Germany and the man who missed the bus. She had lost the military game. She had lost the diplomatic game. She had, in fact, most thoroughly lost faith. Did the illustrious descendant of Marlborough, the best distinguished person, gallop down to the nearest naval base on his foaming charger and offer to lead his men to death or glory? Far from it. He had a more important task to accomplish. He had to set to work without further ado to devise some kind of plausible explanation for the millions of his Britannic Majesty's subjects who were hanging on his words. After more than 48 hours of reflection and excogitation, he produced quite the most miserable effort of his rhetorical career. This remarkable performance, which might well have been billed as positively my last appearance, was staged before the British House of Commons yesterday. For platitudes, inanities, shuffling evasions, and verbosity without content, it stands alone in the history of the old mother of Parliament. The fire-eating, choleric, bragging, Mile's gloriosum suddenly became the nervous advocate with an illegible brief. Those who had expected the thunder of Britain's might to roll forth, those who had waited to see the blue lightning flashing through the oratorical museum of Westminster, must have been sorely disappointed. Let us examine one or two of his fundamental statements, first of all. His most learned strategical advisor, said he, told him that Hitler had made a great mistake. Yes, veritably Germany had committed a blunder which would greatly weaken her position. In fact, one must infer from his words that we have really played it in his hands. He did not go quite so far as to say that the British laying of mines in Norwegian waters had merely been intended to tempt Germany to occupy Scandinavia, he left that to be inferred by his more credulous admirers. But his clever and distorted little mind had worked out a plea designed to convince the British people that what Hitler had done was, after all, a good thing. Reasoning along the same lines, he expressed the conviction, the earnest assurance, that in the new circumstances, it will be much easier for Britain to blockade Germany effectively. If you do not believe me, read his speech for yourself. Yes, Britain now commanded the Pharaohs, and another loophole in the blockade of the Reich was closed. So at one fell swoop, Hitler, by acquiring the coastline of the North Sea and establishing German air bases upon it, had made Mr. Churchill's task much easier. And 
by confiscating the Norwegian and Danish merchant fleets, he had assisted Britain's carrying trade. And by acquiring access to the agricultural wealth of Denmark, Germany had made her starvation more certain. By seizing the iron and timber of Norway, Germany had dealt a fatal blow at her own armament. Yes, as the poet wrote about one of Marlborough's battles, it was a famous victory. So much for Mr. Churchill in the higher style. Let us now descend, if you can bear it, to examine his lower reaches of mental activity. Norway, he said, was a wild, mountainous, unfriendly land where three men could find shelter easily and sight. A great consolation for the Norwegians. Naval warfare, he explained, was less predictable than warfare on land. More distances, storms, mists, and even the darkness of night all played their part. He seems to have been thinking of what British insurance brokers call acts of God. Then said he, you may wonder why I have held all this back until Thursday afternoon. But there was an explanation of the most ingenious order. The British naval personnel, he actually said, were so interested in their work that they often had no time to report what was happening. This is a feature of communication of which any first lord must surely be proud. And in the army, we suppose, the colonel gets a telephone call from his brigadier to ask how things are going, and he curtly says, Look here, old chap, do me now. I'm so busy. Certainly warfare is changing. Then, said the First Lord, German ships will be sunk in the Skagerrak and the Katagan. Whenever the opportunity occurred. This was a brilliant generalization, if not a very blood turning threat. Hitler, of course, is to be deposed when the opportunity occurs. There could, however, he went on, be nothing more stupid than to expect that British forces should constantly patrol the coastal waters of Norway and Denmark, thus constituting targets for Hitler's humor. These were Mr. Churchill's wisest words. The best method of protecting Britain's invaluable forces is to keep them out of Germany's way. Thus, the German occupation of Scandinavia has been accepted as a matter of fact. But, of course, a number of demonstrations must be arranged to convince the British public that Mr. Churchill is still earning his salary. He might have been wiser if he had frankly told the House of Commons that this occupation was so firmly established that practical measures to end it were outside the limits of possibility. Perhaps the most humorous and yet the most pathetic observation which Mr. Churchill made was that in the international office Norway and Denmark had drawn the unlucky numbers. But still, he assured them of British sympathy, and they probably thought of the sympathy which had been poured out so lavishly to Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Finland. The old story has been repeated once again. The cat's paw is used and then discarded. The British government deliberately placed Norway in a compromising position. It was well known to the King's Minister that Germany would not tolerate the occupation of Norwegian waters by British forces. The Norwegian protest was contemptuously rejected, and when Norway had to accept the consequences of British policy, the British Broadcasting Corporation played some Norwegian military marches, and Mr. Churchill expressed his deep sympathy and condolence at the same time pointing out that Norwegian land was well suited to guerrilla tactics. And yet, some people wonder what is meant by the phrase, that hideous... ...a supremely eventful week. It will indeed go down in history as a decisive point in the world of all events have become subordinate in these days to the complete collapse of France. On Monday afternoon, I was several hundred miles away from Berlin in certain military headquarters. I had been learning certain facts from a group of officers whose chief was an old soldier 
who New England well. It was a delightful afternoon, bathed in sunshine, and we were taking a rest after some rather arduous exercise. Then we were suddenly surprised by the entry into the room of another officer who informed us that a Jean Romeldo, that is to say, an announcement of special significance, was to be expected over the radio in a short time. The senior officer present tuned in. I looked out on the beautiful countryside and the rich green of the luxuriant trees. The air was pure and invigorating, and I felt as if I'd had a month's holiday at the seaside. We went on discussing our business, and then the music, it was, I think, the overture to Rienzi, suddenly stopped. And we heard that an announcement of far-reaching importance was going to be made in a few minutes. We wondered what it could be. In our own minds, of course, the thought of French capitulation was insistent. But it seemed a little early. We knew that it would come soon, but to hope that the breakdown of French resistance would be announced in a few minutes seemed a little premature. Perhaps some new and decisive victory had been won. Perhaps then the first flames of the vast Rhine floated through the room. So it had to do with France after all. Again the motif sounded, and again. We looked at the receiving set intently, as people will, quite unnecessarily, but naturally. Then the message came. Marshal Pétain had stated in a broadcast to the French people that France must lay down arms as the struggle could be no longer sustained. He had asked the head of the German state to make known the conditions of an armistice. The Führer was to consult the Duce on the answer which was to be made to this request. Then the sacred German hymn, Deutschland über alles, began. We all stood up reverently and silently thanked our God for this great victory and the relief that it must bring to millions. There were several veterans present wearing the orders and decorations which they had won on the field of battle. They mastered their emotions like the strong men they were. And then, the famous horse vessel leaped. The great National Socialist march crashed out. I thought of all that it had meant during the last painful years of German resurrection. And the National Socialist fighters would fall and that Germany might once again be great. On the Führer's own miraculous message, on the meeting, the organization, the house-to-house -house work, the imprisonment, the ordeal, which had all contributed to the shaping of a new and glorious destiny. And above all, I wish that the old campaigners who had been carried silently home when their work was done might be living to hear these words of history. The music stopped and we looked at each other for a moment in silence. Yes, it was an experience never to be forgotten. I had intended to stay longer, but it was now necessary to finish the task at once. A rapid phone call to Berlin, a few hours of steady work, and I was rushing through the night back to the capital of Great Deutschland. The people of Berlin took the news with calm gratitude. They were happy and proud, but there was no exultation. Rather, there was the clear consciousness of a work to be completed. The general attitude was, yes, we are indeed thankful for this great victory. We want to celebrate, but there will come a time for the celebration of our lives in the near future. 
when the war mongers of England are laid low and our German peace is safe forever. Great scenes of enthusiasm were witnessed in Munich when the Fuhrer and the Duce met to discuss the answer to Marshal Pétain. Munich, the birthplace of the National Socialist Movement, the city where the Fuhrer had once set out with seven men to unify and restore a nation of 80 million, the city through whose streets he had walked, unknown after the shame of that time. Munich, the city from which Mr. Chamberlain had brought peace to England in September 1938, a peace which he undermined systematically by substituting hostility for all his pledges of concord and amity. In those days, Munich had a special significance for England. The millions of Londoners who lined the streets and cheered Chamberlain on his return, then saw it as the city of peace. And so it was seen by its own citizens on this historic occasion. Had Chamberlain and his colleagues only been true to the spirit of the welcome that the British people gave to the news which came on that famous Friday afternoon in the early English autumn, men would be living today whose bones are now rotting. But it was not to be. Meanwhile, there was no cessation of hostilities. Had the French desired one, they could have had it by unconditional surrender. That was a matter of Marshal Pekin. Our army left Paris far behind. With irresistible strength, they swept down south. One victory after another was announced. Lyon, Dijon, Cherbourg, and Brest were captured. The historic city of Strasbourg became German once again. Success followed success with bitter rapidity. At times, the whole thing seemed almost incomprehensible. One never knew what fresh loss was to be added to the achievement of our troops. On Thursday, I was driving outside of Berlin with a friend when we heard the famous Bad and Vira march on the radio on our car. This march is always associated with the personal presence and appearance of the Fuhrer. We wondered what it betokened on this occasion. After a while, we heard the news that Bad and Vira and Faith and Alpha had been captured. It was the place associated with the Fuhrer's personal mark. On the next day, the Fuhrer went to the chief of the German forces and the foreign minister of the Reich into the forest of Compiègne. There also entered these woods the representatives of the French Republic. At approximately 3.30 on the afternoon of June the 21st, the discussion concerning the armistice began. It was here that in November 1918 the terms of disgrace and all the evil that ensued from them were imposed on Germany. It was here that Marshal Foch, curtly and sardonically, asked the German delegates what they expected from him. It was in the very same railway carriage that the dictates of oppression and conquest were made known to the Germans in flat violation of all the promises whereby President Wilson had persuaded the unbeaten German forces to lay down their arms. On this occasion, however, the delegates of the defeated nation were welcomed by a military guard of honor. They were personally greeted by the Führer, who, as the head of the state, might well have awaited their salutation. He had taken particular care that no dishonorable association should attach to this meeting with a vanquished but gallant foe. The French representatives were allowed facilities, which were abruptly denied to the German delegates of 1918. For example, they were enabled to communicate by telephone with our government. And it is clear that they were not rushed in their deliberation. Fortunately for them, they had to deal with a chivalrous soldier and a statesman too great for any pettiness of mind or conduct. It was made plain that the object of the negotiations 
was to procure permanent peace between France and Germany. To redress the wrongs which Germany had suffered in the past. And to give Germany security in the war which the British government insists on pursuing to the bitter end. And bitter it will be for England. Even as the world awaited the results of these discussions in the forest of Compiègne, the question, what next, was already in millions of minds. To the curious, a sufficient indication should be given by the fact that Germany, settling with France, is taking all necessary precautions to ensure that a complete settlement with England shall be possible in the very near future. We waited for the news, and then, last night, we learned that the German French officers had been signed at 6.50 p.m. For the English people, the complete collapse of French resistance after mere six weeks of fighting, ought to be a salutary warning. The French forces were better trained, better equipped, and more numerous than the British. And the defeat of France within six weeks after the entry of German troops into Belgium and Holland is the most eloquent testimony as to what Germany can do in modern warfare. It needs no stressing. The bare fact is so gigantic as almost to pass comprehension. Churchill, the dictator of Britain, is interested solely in the old world of Jewish international finance. If he can say that, and he won't, he wants to say nothing with his own skin. In the face of certain defeat, he is exposing Britain to invasion and the horrors of war. The old campaign of lies about German weakness continues in England, unabated. The people seem like dumb, driven animals, unable to speak with a voice of their own. Patriotic Englishmen are in prison because they dare I'd recommend the wisdom of peace. And so, even as peace dawns over the French people, twilight spreads over England, and in the night of our sorrow, the men who have ruined and betrayed her will slip away and leave the people to their fate. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to listen to that famous commentator of present world days, Lord Hohar, speaking to England. just gone by, it began with a feeling of tension and suspense. The great offensive against France had been brought to a victorious conclusion. The French had laid down arms, and throughout the world people wondered when the final act, the offensive against British soil, would come. In Germany, and many other countries, particularly in England. There was a firm conviction that it wouldn't come soon, and that conviction remained. The day and the hour are the Fuhrer's secret, and he has returned in triumph to Berlin. 
amid scenes of unprecedented rejoicing. And we enter into a week that may be even more sensational than any we have yet experienced. The great exodus from Britain is well underway. The rich and affluent are removing themselves and their valuables as fast as they can. Great stretches of the coastline have been evacuated to a depth of 20 miles. Hastily improvised defences are being erected, which are things of papier mache and cardboard in comparison with the Maginot Line and the forts of Liège. The city is quaking, and whilst genuine business has practically come to a standstill in London, speculators are enjoying a brief paradise. There is naturally a strong prejudice in favour of spot cash dealing. None of the sharks wants to take the risk of waiting for settlement there. The political prisoners who have been arrested and thrown into jail without trial are, it is said, to be transported to Canada. Thus, a fresh crime has to be perpetrated by the corrupt dictator of England against men and women who are bad to say in time that peace offered the only hope for their country. Indeed, the land of democratic liberty present a macabre picture today. Dissolution, over, over its moribund institutions, and the smell of decay is in the air. Whilst the great question of the hour remains as yet unanswered, this last week has been fertile in one respect. It has produced the most crashing blow has ever been delivered at Britain's prestige. And that blow, interesting to relate, has been delivered, not by the Fuhrer, but by Winston Churchill, the aged satire, whose talent for injuring those who trust him is unique. With the murderous attack by a British naval squadron on the French ships at Oran, Churchill's last claim to be treated as a human being vanishes. The spectacle of the Royal Navy firing on French warships that were not under steam and could not maneuver is the worthy sequel to the criminal attack on the Altmark in Jürgenfjord. An attack, by the way, which has been fully and justly avenged. Before, however, we examine this most disgraceful act in English history, we had better look at its antecedents. The German forces succeeded in capturing the French military archives on the Loire. The documents which were seized have proved infinitely revealing. They show, amongst other things, how the British government proposed to involve Scandinavia, the Balkans, and Turkey in war with Germany, and even outlined measures of coercion, which were to have been adopted to the event. They mentioned plans for the bombing of Batum and Baku. They demonstrate how, if Mr. Churchill had had his way, these neutral countries would have been ravaged by the horrors of war. But, as you now know, all these plans and schemes went awry. The gallant beginning which Churchill made in Scandinavia resulted in the headlong flight of the British forces from Norway, and the design to invade the Ruhr produced in six weeks the surrender of Holland, Belgium, and France. The captured archives, however, are extremely interesting from another point of view. They show the miserable niggardly, grudging, and altogether ineffectual help, which Churchill placed at the disposal of his unfortunate allies. If he and his colleagues had said at the beginning of last September 
that they had no intention of making any real contribution to the defense of France, the French would have known exactly where they stood. On the contrary, they were assured with lavish professions of false affection that Britain would stand by them with her whole power. We have already had something to say about the glorious retreat of the British expeditionary force from Flanders. And we have previously commented, I think, on the fact that Churchill could not or would not muster up more than ten divisions to take part in the Battle of France, although in the World War it had been possible for England to provide 85. But until we had documentary evidence to the contrary, it might have been possible for the Ministry of Information to state, with however little plausibility, that the measure of support which Britain was contributing was in accordance with some sort of agreement between the British and French general staff. Now we know that no such concord existed. On the contrary, the inner history of the relations between the two governments and the two commands is one long story of appeals for help on the French side and callous refusal or evasion on the British. Let me give a few examples from the correspondence. On May the 15th, General Gamla wired to Air Marshal Newall for ten squadrons of British planes. The next day, he found it necessary to prefer the same request to Mr. Churchill. He did so in insistent language and reminded the British Prime Minister that he had asked for them before. This telegram went at 10.30 in the morning. At 2.30 in the afternoon, he had to send another telegram to the same noble friend of La Belle France. It did no more good than the other two. On May the 17th, he wired to Churchill again, this time demanding that the Royal Air Force should make its contribution to the Battle of France and pointing out that the position of the French troops was one of extreme peril. Seven days later came a complaint from Churchill to the effect that the French general staff was not cooperating adequately with the British. On May the 30th, General Vigon telegraphed to the British High Command his most insistent request that the British air forces, which had retired to England, should be sent back to France. On June the 3rd, General Vermeer saw the end coming. He begged Monsieur Renault to use all his influence with Churchill to secure the assistance of the Royal Air Force. He might as well have saved himself the trouble of writing the dispatch. Now these are but a few instances out of many. They are typical of the whole. And after reading these documents, I wonder why the French commanders should have felt themselves under any obligation whatsoever to the British government, and even more, why Churchill had the brazen incident to tell the world that he could not see any reason why Marshal Pétain should have asked for terms, or why the French should have laid down arms. This miserable protégé of Barney Barrow knows better than anybody else in the world the story of the French defeat. He was warned again and again of what would happen. But when patriotic Frenchmen decided that their armies could fight no longer, and that it was their duty to save as much of France as they could, the degenerate of Downing Street turned upon men whom he had been lording to the sky and hurled at them reproaches as unjust as they were undignified. He went further, and in the futile hope of disturbing the armistice, at whatever cost to the French people, he set up a freak French government in London, making a cashiered and disgraced officer, or should we say ex-officer, 
to be precise, the head of any and all Frenchmen who are prepared to betray their country and follow it. The futile idiocy of this ridiculous and spiteful act soon became apparent. The English people saw through it and realized that this handful of renegades no more represented France than they represented China. The British public was nervous and demoralized. Something had to be done. It was necessary to score a propaganda success at any price. Therefore, hoping the bluff might be sufficient to serve the purpose, Churchill ordered the British Navy to seize certain French naval units which lay within its reach. The French commanders, in loyalty to the armistice, decided to reject Churchill's impudent request. Thereupon, in accordance with Churchill's orders, British ships and planes opened fire on the French vessels, inflicting, as we are told, heavy casualties. Only a small fraction of the French fleet was involved, but as it was attacked at a disadvantage, there was much bloodshed, which was dutifully cheered by the House of Commons. Diplomacy could scarcely go any further. These fat and pompous plutocrats behaved as if they had scored a great victory over Germany. Instead of making a treacherous attack on their fallen allies. I cannot help remembering how in Henry IV, Falstaff feigned death whilst the combat was raging about him. But when the fighting had ceased, raised his head cautiously and crept over to the prostrate body of Hotspur and then stabbed it in the thigh with his knife. This noble act having been performed, he went off to claim the chief honors of the... The diplomatic correspondent of the Italian newspaper Tribuna writes that England and France are spreading false and misleading rumors about alleged intentions of Germany in the Balkans to create trouble and panic in that area, which has so far been kept out of the war. The Italian journalist points out that these allegations against Germany are entirely unfounded because every German interest favors the maintenance of peace in the Balkans, whereas only England and France could be interested in causing trouble in this region, which is so important for German supplies. This evening, I am talking to you about Germany. That is a concept that many of you may have failed to understand. Let me tell you that in Germany there still remains the spirit of unity and the spirit of strength. Let me tell you that here we have a united people who are modest in their wishes. They are not imperialists. They don't want to take what doesn't belong to them. All they want is to live their own simple lives, undisturbed by outside influences. That is the Germany that we know. I can remember when I cast my memory back to 1932 and 1931. I can remember how everything that could be done to stimulate the hatred of England against Germany was done. I remember how my old friend said, what shall we do with this man Hitler? He wants Poland. He wants Czechoslovakia. What shall we do if he wants more than that? Now, 
it does behove you to think at the moment how much Stalin has taken and how much Stalin wishes. I ask you to remember that in 1939, in August, the only question was that of bringing Danzig back the Reich. No more and no less. What a small problem that was in comparison with those that confront us today. Surely, if only we had had the common sense to agree that the German people of Danzig should go back to the Reich, then we might have had peace. We might have avoided all the terrible sacrifices of the last five and a half years we might have avoided the hatreds which can only be very gradually repaired. Now I say to you, my English listeners, the trouble is this. Germany, if you like, is not anymore the chief factor in Europe. Germany, maybe, I may be wrong, I will only say that the German arms have been in many battlefields defeated. But I ask you, how could it ever be possible for England to maintain a front against Soviet Russia unless she had the help of the German Legion. That is a question which may perhaps be debated and discussed ad infinitum. I cannot promise that I can give any solution to it tonight. I can only say that if Germany and England together had decided to preserve the welfare of this country, then I should have hope. Then I should be happy, an optimist. But so far as I can see, the policy of England has been to allow Germany to sacrifice her very last the ultimate end of her resources in an attempt to stay the Bolshevik attack. If I am right, then I can only say that the people of Britain deserve what they get in the future. I speak now personally I want to talk to you of what I know and what I feel. I have always hoped and believed that in the last resort there would be an alliance, a combine, an understanding between England and Germany. Well, at the moment, that seems impossible. Good. If it cannot be, then I can only say that the whole of my work has been in vain. I can only say that I have day in and day out called the attention of the British people to the menace from the East, which confronted them. And if they will not hear, if they are determined not to hear, then I can only say 
the faith which overcomes them in the end, will be the faith they have measured. For I cannot say. Well, now this evening we have to discuss rather a difficult question, that of Poland. I know that many of you are sick and tired of the name, but still, when we look back upon the past five or six years, we cannot help remembering that Poland was the pretext for the declaration of war on Germany. The Western Allies said, Poland is in danger. Therefore, we must take up arms. I hope that in these days, five and a half or six years after, we have not completely forgotten that challenge. Of course, much has happened in the meantime. I am willing to grant you with regard to the Baltic states and Poland and the Balkans. Churchill has given away everything that could be given away. That I grant you, but still I believe that in the ordinary British mind there will continue the belief that if any one power dominates Europe, there can be no peace, there can be no security for Britain. And today the position is that the German Wehrmacht stands between the Soviet hordes and the British Army. If the Wehrmacht were to give up, if the resistance were to finish, then I can only say that you, the British people, would have to make your own terms with the Bolsheviks and what sorry terms there would be. I don't want to predict. I will not enter into discussions. The San Francisco conference alone shows how little you have to expect from the Bolsheviks. And therefore, in conclusion, I would only say, just make sure that the end of this world war is not the beginning of a greater world war than you have ever imagined to be possible. Now, in this the most serious time of our modern age, I beg you to realize that the fight is on. You have heard something about the Battle of Berlin. You know there a tremendous world shattering conflict is being made. Good. I'm going to say the men who have died in the Battle of Berlin have given their lives to show that whatever else happens, Germany will live. No coercion, no oppression, no measures of tyranny that any foreign foe can introduce will shatter Germany. Germany will live. the people of Germany have in them the secret of life, endurance, will, 
and purpose. And therefore I say to you, in these last words, you may not hear from me again for a few months. I say, Es liebe Deutschland. I love you. And farewell.